four, three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one, powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. And good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome to Talk Recovery Radio. My name is Giuseppe Ganchi. This is my co-host, Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hey, Darren. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And uh, there you can have all the replays. You can uh, follow us and so forth on uh, iTunes and YouTube and Spotify and, and, and so forth. So hope you like our show, everybody. Seven seasons, seven years, hundreds of shows, thousands of guests. It's been a good time, eh, Darren? It's amazing. Amazing to think of the, the volume of, of topics and conversations and personal stories and you know, truth being revealed and, and shared. Uh, and, and I mean, I don't directly know some of the personal impacts. I mean, we've had some feedback, you know, in, in text form or comment form. Yeah. But like, I, I, I must assume that our listeners or those listening are, are in tune for what the subject is and, and, are connected to somebody that needs to hear these stories and you know what that's what that's bringing about just just by having conversations awesome conversation that's what it's all about and having conversations is you know i remember having a, t- a time in my life where you know i was it wasn't having conversations with a lot of people i was just stuck in my addiction uh you know we, we got a great show plan for today a great guest that's coming up on the show um you know but uh we we can't uh, start the show off with without showing um, some type of respect and 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 having a conversation about uh, the the tragedy that's unfolding in Canada um, with the 215 children that were found um, on the grounds at a former residential school in Kamloops, BC. Uh, very tragic and very sad. And and uh, you know, as a as a settler here, um, it, it's hard for me to comprehend. Um, you know, what, what are the next steps and, and what to do, eh, Darren? I mean, I had, I had a couple of days, you know, especially considering, you know, having an audience, um, you know, being on the Vancouver Co-op radio station, there's, there's a lot of Indigenous programming on here and, and we support each other and, you know, I, I, I was confused uh, that, uh, you know, I, I'll admit it, white guilt set in, you know, that, that, um, you know, cause I'm a white guy and, and uh, I, I dawned on me, you know, and I thought like, we need, we need permission. We need, we need an indigenous person to say it's okay to talk. And you know what I mean? Like I went through that confusion as well. And then I realized that although you know, the tragedy and and the history is direct, you know, racism, systemic racism, and and the, and the outflow of, of that history currently still exists. Um, But the solution is not race based. It, it, this is a, this is a human thing. When I think about what I want to do, what I need to do, what can I do? It's not, what can I do as a white person? This is what, what can I do and how can I feel as a human being, you know, that, that lives in, in, in a sense of freedom uh, in, in a country that we need to be proud of. Well, that, all that stuff is, is starting to question, like, what in fact am I proud of? You mm-hmm. know, what, what is my national anthem actually mean to me and, 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 and things like that. Um, because in, in reality, I mean, I was thinking, I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm reading on as much as I can, more than I'd ever been, uh, I don't want to say interested in before, but this spiked an interest for sure for me. And well, one thing that uh, our viewers can do, I know I'm going to, you know, uh, challenge myself to do as well is, is really take a look at um, the truth and Con reconciliation documents and, and, and see what it's really all about and what is truth and, and reconciliation uh, mean for, uh, for healing. Um, also, there are um, opportunities to uh, donate to the Residential School Survivor Society, um, and their website is uh, www.irsss, that's three S's, irsss.ca, and uh, lots of information on there about um, having conversations on how to support. I think this is a BC organization as well. Um, so, uh, you know, read up on the truth of reconciliation, um, have some, uh, you know, I've read some news articles and, and, and Indigenous people right now are just asking for some space and some time uh, to heal and, and then, you know, try to, to have some resolution on that. So honoring that space and some time. And again, you can make a donation um, at Indian Residential School Survivor Society. And, and obviously this has a lot to do with addiction as well. There's lots of people with trauma and, and have addiction issues and, and stories of residential school survivors. So it's all interconnected. And I, I, my thoughts and condolences are out there uh, I'm, and Darren's as well. And, and um, we will continue to push and attend. Yeah and advocate for for all the healing of all of, of all the, the the suffering that's out there mm. as a result of so many things you're listening to talk recovery radio vancouver co-op radio 100.5 fm thanks for joining us and uh, at the end of the show towards the end we're going to talk about uh, vancouver model for decrim um the uh, the mayor of vancouver has launched his uh, final version of the uh, thresholds for drugs and uh, we're going to have a conversation about that because those of you that follow our show know that we talk a lot about the portuguese model and how vancouver harm reduction advocates are against the vancouver model of decrim uh, um, so we'll have more details on that uh, towards the end of the show. Uh, but uh, we always have awesome guests in the middle to talk about various conversations about recovery, addiction, from food to drugs to gambling. And today's an interesting show. Darren, who are we talking recovery with today? Yeah, we get to talk recovery with Rianne Davis. Uh, she's a recovering sex and love addict with 11 years of sobriety. Uh, she hosts A Secret Life a podcast where guests share their secrets, release the shame attached to them, and share their experience, strength, and hope. Uh, also has just authored and released her first best-selling novel, Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. Um, and uh, an actor, accomplished director, producer, writer, yada, yada, yada. Uh, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> it's... It's heavy. It's heavy uh, but, I've never heard you say that. <laughs> well, I, I don't yada yada a lot. So there, there's a, there's okay. a lot there. Welcome to the show, Brianne Davis. Hi, I love that. I sound so much cooler than I actually am. Like, I'm really not that cool. I promise. <laughs> Canadians make everyone look cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, this is, this is exciting. Um, because like Giuseppe say, we, I mean, the topics have ranged, you know, and sometimes they get into some generalities, you know, like they're interwoven, which, which you know, sex and love, mm. addiction. I mean, we hear a lot of sex addiction. I, I, I think right off the top of, our, of my head anyways, it's like, yeah, there's, there's therapies out there for, for that. But love addiction, like that, mm -hmm. that's a little, a little more subtle. That has me questioning, you know, well, I've been obsessed. I've been infatuated. I've, you know, I've chased obsessively. <laughs> um, but so let's talk about the difference or is there a difference from sex and love and to be a love addict? Are there extreme symptoms of that? Yeah. Or, or is it what I just rattled off? Is well, you rattling off is very, you know, I'm like, ooh, does he need a seat in our room? Like, <laughs> I have a seat here warm for you. But, you know, what I how I describe it is sex and love addiction is so gray. It's so complicated. It's not black and white like drugs and alcohol. And, you know, people that 
love, you know, the chemical dependency. They reach for the bottle, the drug, uh, the smoking, all that stuff. With sex and love addiction, we are addicted to people, right? Um, And this is the easiest way I can break it down. I try to make it very simple. So the sex addiction side, you are addicted to one night stands, you know, hot cheating, having multiple relationships that kind of overlap, always having one foot in the door, one foot out. And you're more addicted to the sexual act, not exactly the person, you know, and it's also you are constantly like DMing and swiping left and right for that perfect partner to find that hit that fails you, right? So go to the love addiction side. It's you're addicted to fantasy, romance, bad relationships, getting the same pattern, going back to the same unavailable person over and over again. So you're more addicted to a particular person. But what happens is with sex and love addiction, like any other addiction, it's a progressive brain disease. So you're addicted to this qualifier, this person, and then you'll do sexual things to keep them that you don't really want to do and you use your sexuality for control and power. And then if it gets too intimate, then you're disconnected and unavailable. So it's really how I like to say it. It's we have trouble connecting sexuality and intimacy because underneath it all, we are unavailable. We have low self-esteem, not a lot of self-love, self-worth, fear of abandonment, fear of never being enough. And here's the thing. I speak at a lot of recovery centers. And the number one thing that takes people out of the alcohol program, the drug program is relationships. And this is where I like to say it's just as deadly as a chemical dependency. I know more people that have committed suicide, lost their sobriety, 30 years in AA over a relationship, gone to jail. My old sponsor I had for eight years, it was just in jail because she went back to that unavailable man that wouldn't leave his wife and promised her like this time I'll leave. And she went psychologically crazy. And, you know, I spoke in jails for two and a half years at a women's LA County jail. And every woman there was it for sex and love addiction. Watch a dateline, just watch a dateline. And every single one is about a relationship and someone's cheating or wants out and they don't know how to do it. Is, can, can, <laughs> we, can I stereotype? Can, can, is this yeah. primarily more female uh, affected? No. No. So there's, there's no no. Darren, Darren, you went to rehab. Come on. <laughs> hey, you probably you probably been 13 steps somewhere, I, I, right? I, or yeah, 13 yeah, steps just, somebody else. <laughs> like the, the dateline stuff, you know, like the 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 psychotic wife, you know, the right. the, the women murderer, like those sort of shows. There's, yeah, it's it's kind of like involved in that rather than just being a, like a psycho dude that uh, but I mean these are general no yeah no I'm glad you said that because usually that people think sex addiction is men and love addiction is women right. but really I've been in the program almost 12 years have 11 and a half years of sobriety now and they said when I first started six percent of the United States were sex and love addicts and 38 percent of those are women I have to tell you after a decade the numbers have skyrocketed. A lot of men come in and they're addicted to these women. I had this heroin addict. He quit heroin for 20 years. And he said, I can quit heroin, but I can't quit her. The withdrawal from this woman is so painful. I cannot let her go. This is such an important topic because I mean, everyone's talking about the overdose crisis. Yeah. Mm Fentanyl's killing people. Okay. We got that. But we're never going to, like, we're, we can't just fix it if we fix the fentanyl problem. Mm-hmm. We need to fix the whole person. And I, I mean, I work in a rehab center. Last Door puts on this show. Yeah. Almost every client here, there's something going on in regards to people, places, and things. And usually it's always people. It's my yeah. wife, my girlfriend, my, you know, I have Parents. a wife and girlfriend, strippers. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is just, it's just, you know, but I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so for those watching that are kind of like, what, what, what is this Who sex is this and woman? love? So, so um, there's a fellowship called sex and love addicts yes. anonymous. Correct. Okay? And um, so there's, there's not just AA or NA there's CMA. There's, there's so many just Google 
fellowship is anonymous, all coming from the AA program. Okay, so so for those of you that don't know, there is an anonymous program. That's why she said, Darren, there's a seat for you in this room. <laughs> Darren's happily married with two beautiful children. Um, so hey, then, no, I'm married with a child and there's a seat in a room for me. It doesn't okay. matter on well, the I'm outside. glad you said that. I'm glad yes. you said that. So now you said you've been sober for 11 and a half years. Yes. What does that mean in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous? Does that okay. mean you also don't drink or what does that mean? No, I am not addicted to alcohol at all. My only addiction is people. I'm addicted to fantasy and romance. Also, it, it can be porn addiction. It can be masturbation. All of that is tied into Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And it is be based on AA 12 Steps. So for me, my sobriety is based on bottom lines. So we have bottom lines. Everybody's bottom line is different. So let me just tell you mine 11 and a half years ago. I was not allowed to cheat on my partner. I wasn't allowed to text, email, or talk to any men whatsoever. I had to get rid of all men in my life completely. And that looked like I would go to a restaurant and have to look down and not make eye contact with the waiter. Because what I did in every situation is I put out that energy, that energy raping other people to flirt, to intrigue with me, to give me my worth. I walked down the street wanting people to look at me, to fill me. Every Everything was about taking other people, getting their attention and filling me. So I had to cut off every single thing. And I have to tell you that withdrawal, not saying any other withdrawal is not brutal, but it was nine months. I cried every day for nine months, crawling on the floor, the emotions, crying. I had a crying session that lasted 45 minutes where it was like an exorcism outside of my body. I went therapy twice a week for eight years. It took me nine years to work my 12 steps. And I actually worked my 12 steps through the AA big book, Herb K's program that I love. You know, my fourth step was 176 people on my resentment list. It was brutal. That took me two and a half years. So what they say about slaw, the nickname is slaw, sex and love addicts anonymous. They say, you know, AA is that last house on the block you don't want to go to, like nobody wants to go in. Slaw is like the shack in the back that like <laughs> nobody wants to go to. It's like the lowest point. So I say, if you walk into a Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous room, you're literally on the last line because underneath that alcohol, drugs, shopping, eating, gambling, whatever, whatever we put on Netflix, Instagram, social media, everything we put on top of that underneath is that core trauma or core pain or tools for having healthy relationships we did not get. And it's that fear of abandonment, fear of loneliness, fear of not being worthy, fear of not being loved, fear of intimacy, all that lies underneath every other addiction. So it's a brutal program. Honestly, only 5% of people stick around. The revolving door of our program is out of control. Yeah. But if you stick around, if you do the work, there is so much peace on the other side because I don't use anything outside of myself anymore. Nobody outside of myself fills me, gives me why. I say if my husband left me today, and we've been together 16 years, so I started the program while we were together. If he left me today, I would be okay. I couldn't say that 11, 11 and a half years ago when I was having multiple relationships, cheating, intriguing, flirting, being on set, like trying to hook up with someone, you know, like it was just, you know, what so I just, much drama. I, I am going to share the uh, and shit's an okay word. I'm going to share the shit out of this interview because we've oh done this show for seven years and that last couple of minutes there just so powerful talk awesome. about surrender talk about powerlessness talk about you know um forgiveness of self talk about the ability to be good with or without like that everyone's fighting for space and and solving the addiction crisis and the yeah. reality is is if you just let go and are good with or without like just the freedom in that is amazing and like it you is. put it so eloquently in that that conversation like if if he's with me that's great and if he's not that's okay too. I know. I mean, there's and some people, people get really mad when I say that, just so you know, I've spoken and men have come up to me and be like, how dare you say that about your husband? And I've been like, no, my husband's actually okay with it. He does not want me to use him to give me my self-worth. That is too much responsibility for a mm. human being. There that is go. too much responsibility. 
<laughs> that makes sense. I, yeah. I mean, the whole point, whatever the addiction is, is that I'd be okay with or without. Exactly. Like that, that blanket statement, if it means something to you, you've done well. If it's something that you want to work towards, well, that's, that's your story yet to be determined. And, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the candor of, you know, the eight years, like so many people, you know, okay, I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm asking for help. I'm, I'm in a place, you know, whether it's 12 step or I'm in a place of some sort of recovery and, and I've stopped for two weeks. I've, I've, I've abstained for two weeks. I can do anything for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know how many times I detoxed off of heroin? Like no problem. Right. For, for other reasons. Right. And it's that, it's that aspect of, of changing and, and who do I become? What do I use now to cope? Like, mm -hmm. how do I get, how do you get, there's a question. How do you get validation? Because I, I think it's, it's human nature to require a, a certain level of validation. Uh, one of, of, you know, our true selves, our, our integrity, our dignity, um, not the validation that fills our ego. So, right, right, right. So how do you, how did you switch? Did you abstain? Like you said, looking on the ground, no validation, suffering, pain, withdrawal. What, what was the valid, what was replacing that? Oh, I love this question. So first, let me just say, you know, the first year of my sobriety, I did not work as an actor. I could not walk into a room and become a character when I was an empty shell of a person. It was like putting a mask on top of a mask on top of a mask. And also for the first year, I did not have sex with my boyfriend. We lived together. He's my husband now. We did not have sex for Good a for him. year. <laughs> Good but, for him. And here we had very clear boundaries. He was not allowed to come and give, give me comfort when I was crying. He wasn't allowed to fix it. He wasn't allowed to be my knight in shining armor. We wow. set up very strict boundaries and we were both willing to let go of the relationship for me to get healthy. And luckily my higher power God had chose someone that had 20 something years in sobriety of AA. He's 32 years sober right now in AA and uh -huh. 10 years sober in DA, Debtors Anonymous. So we are a 12 step family and we did the work. And the first thing that I did was I literally turned my will and my life over to the care of God, which is step three is the hardest step for me to do every day yep. to turn something because I want to believe that I'm never taken care of. I'm a victim. He's not going to take care of me. I am not enough. I need to manipulate and maneuver and have power and control over everyone. So it goes my way. So that was the first thing. And that's a daily practice for me. I'm talking prayer constantly. And if anybody's listening, like I did not believe in a God at all. I'm not a religious person. I didn't grow up religious, but if you said the word God to me, I would start cracking up like sucker. Like that was my thought, like loser. You like, so it was cutting, it was cutting out that ego, that edging God out that we do and making it humble, like humble myself. Anything good that happens to me is God. Anything bad that happens to me is God. And I am okay on the other side. The other way I got self-love myself instead of reaching outside for career, money, a new guy, a new high, falling in love. Like that is the most intoxicating drug in the world, falling in love. Like give me the butterflies, give me the first of everything. That is what I'm addicted to. And the moment that wore off, I thought the relationship was over. So it's learning those healthy boundaries with my sponsor, learning how to have you know, to show up for people when I say I'm going to show up to say, no, I'm not going to do that to, to speak my truth out of a place of humility, not a pay, place of power and control. So those are the things I really did. And then I think, you know, just showing up every day, sitting in a chair saying me too, I am an addict. I am a sex and love addict. I am grateful. I am a sex and love addict now, because I do have to tell you this one story. And it's really important to me. I'm a lifer which that means I'm going to be in the program forever. I'm married. I have a kid now. He's three years old. 
they do not complete me. My kid triggers the crap out of me. You know, my husband can trigger the crap out of me. And I, I want to be like, peace. I'm packing up my bag. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going on location to shoot a movie with a bunch of hot people. Like, I don't need to be here. I want to live in fantasy. But I know that's not real. I'm a worker among workers. I am no better, no less than. I can't compare and despair. I can't spend a long time on social media. But this one day, something, when I was going to get my six-month chip and I was leading a meeting, I was speaking for 20 minutes at my home meeting in Los Angeles. And afterwards, I went to In-N-Out Burger at 9.30 at mm. night. I was like, I'm going to go have an In-N-Out Burger. I just shared and did, you know, like, congrats to me. So I pull up at the drive through you guys. And I, after placing my order and this 15 year old, 16 year old pimply face work kid, kid, total kid, like a teenager opens the window. And he was like, Oh, he did this, like a gasp. Like uh, he found me attractive. And I kid you not, I kid you not. It was like heroin <laughs> got up my entire body and the power and control I felt over this 16 year old was like my entire body was on fire. And that was the moment I was like, I'm going to have this disease forever. Mm. Like I am always going to want to manipulate and have control and get my needs met through other people. Yeah. Especially when it lays itself right out there for you. And oh yeah. God's like, here, are you ready to completely surrender? You just got your six month chip. You know, they give you those tests. Like, are you really ready to keep going down that path? Or are you going to turn back? You know? Yeah. I, I mean, a dope fiend always knows, you know, the other dope fiends in the room. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, we walk through an airport. It's like, uh-huh. You know, th like we just know. And uh... I do too, man. I go on set on films and I remember being like, and you're sleeping with the wardrobe girl and you're cheating yeah. on your wife and you're yeah. obsessed and you're not living your truth like it, i used to like it's, a, it's almost like game on you know what yeah. i mean it's like there's a switch that we have and it's just like game on let's you know we're gonna do this i have a question so mm -hmm. you 11 and a half years in mm -hmm. in do you say sober yeah, I say sober. Yeah. Okay. So you mm -hmm. say sober, but it doesn't have anything to do with alcohol. No. Nope. Um, so for, so how, how do you relapse if you're not, uh, if there's no drugs and there's no drinking, like what's the, what's the barometer bottom line. So okay. like, so in NA, like if you use, you relapse and alcohol, if you use alcohol, you relapse. I mean, right. there's some gray areas with pot and, and psychedelics and that's another show. <laughs> um, so so who sets the the bar and and like how fluid is it how do you how do you well for me now after 11 and a half years my main bottom line is I cannot go outside of my committed relationship it's really that simple you know when okay. you start you take away you got to imagine you take away every dramatic relationship you have that could be a parent I took a year off my dad it's a very emotionally incestuous relationship he wouldn't you know, go with my boundaries. He would talk to me a certain way. Um, then, you know, it, it's friendships, people that don't show up for you because you never actually showed up for them. You have to clear away everything. So like I said at the beginning, you know, I wouldn't make eye contact. I didn't have any guy friends. I, you know, we didn't have sex for a while. I couldn't masturbate if I was having a feeling. I people like can't look at porn forever like that's a huge one in our program because it's just fantasy you go into fantasy and, and who helps you figure that out so well your every, sponsor your, your sponsor, sponsor yeah. yeah you you can't yeah. really set your own bottom lines okay that's, that's what like, I <laughs> that's like using your addict mind to fix your addict mind like that that does not work okay. so so the so sponsors kind of roll mm -hmm. in and and yeah. the literature like the the mm -hmm. is what's what do you have for literature in that program I mean you're not a spokesperson for slow, no, so I will be knows. a spokesperson. Okay. I will be the, okay. the temporary spokesperson. Okay. But like, no, we have a workbook, a slaw workbook. We have a slaw big book that is based on and the AA 12. We have a 12 and 12 now, which I love. I love the AA 12 and 12. We have other P Melody does love addiction books. We have a lot of outside literature, but the main ones is our slaw book, our workbook and the 12 and 12. So if you're going to 12 step meetings, I mean, obviously right now everything's on Zoom, so it's mm -hmm. kind of different. I'm not going to go there, but in person meetings when they're back on on in full swing, uh, you know, and and you're finding yourself 
compulsively 13 stepping or always wanting to help the opposite sex with their feelings and uh, you know I got called out on it one time you know someone's like hey you're you know I'm, I'm a gay man and and with no real you know somebody said hey you know you like you, you help a lot of younger people out like how about uh, you know helping people your own age and I thought about that and I was just <laughs> like well you know what is that and I did some work around that and everything and 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 all that and 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 you know you I see guys here you know this is a male treatment center it's like they're you know best friends or the girls in the meeting and it's like, it's just like well she's gonna be making best Look, friends I'm laughing. Guys. <laughs> I, I, I'm there to help her you know and, and all that kind of stuff and without I, devaluing people I helping help people because there are healthy relationships out there is mm-hmm. just check yourself and if your blood boils when the question's asked you probably need to do some work on it and that's what you're talking about about the you know you felt like a heroin was being injected it's 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 like you know normalcy shouldn't feel like a heroin buzz <laughs> you know well, at least thing. i don't think it should we have a rule in sex and love addicts anonymous that you cannot help the people you're attracted to. So if you are doing that, start with that. Like, don't go to the people you're attracted to, help the people you're not attracted to. And if you are listening, go online right now, fill out the 40 questions. There's 40 yes or no questions. And where's online? So type in Google, 40 self-diagnosed sex and love addicts anonymous. You could 40 self-diagnosed question sex addict. You can even type that in. And there are easy questions like, do you try to find someone to fix you? Are you constantly searching for your soulmate? Do you lost number of the count of people you've been with? Do you masturbate when you don't want to feel your feelings? Are you addicted to porn? It's things like that, that are really easy. And they say, if you get five or more yeses, you might have this problem. And I have to tell you, I mean, I wrote about it in the book about the first time I did the 40 questions. And for me, I got a 38 out of 40. And you're supposed to answer it through your whole life, not just right now, because a lot of people like to answer it like, but I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. No, answer it through your whole life. Have you ever done these things? Have you cheated? Those kind of things. Another subject for the show. Um, yes. You did write a book. And yes, we I want did. to talk about that. <laughs> um, so it's called Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. Yes. So Darren, Yay. I'm sure, has a bunch of questions. There's a, there's a copy of the book, uh, the covers of the book. Mm-hmm. So what is, I mean, you've told us your life story so far. Yeah. Um, so we always like to ask authors, how did you get from being a sex and love addict to writing a book? Like what, what made you want to write this book? I didn't. Let's oh. just be very clear. I okay. never wanted to write this book. I was never going to break my anonymity. I'm of service to people in my community. I speak all over the world in recovery centers, but I was not interested ever. But what happened was when I got a decade of recovery, this overwhelming feeling I got be of service bigger than myself. So what I did, my husband came up to me and he was like, hey, there's this writing class. I think you should take it. And I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? I am ADHD. I'm dyslexic. I'm an actress. I don't write dialogue. Leave me alone. That was pretty my my response. And then he kept mentioning it six times. And I'm like, fine, I'll take the class. And I wrote the first draft in 45 days. It was like something bigger than me wanted me to write it. I never wanted to write it. And then I wrote this article for HuffPost, being a female sex and love addict. It was during the Harvey Weinstein, all that stuff coming out, all these men saying they were sex and sex addicts because they got caught. And it really frustrated me and my community because the only reason people say they're sex addicts if they get caught and they're going to rehab. And so this big overwhelming feeling was like, well, I have this book. I'm going to write this article for HuffPost and out myself and say all the stuff that, you know, I've thought done in this article. And I have to tell you the morning that that came out, I thought the world was going to end. Like, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm an actress. I'm a working actress for 20 years. This, what am I doing? My life is over. And (laughs) two hours passed and nothing happened. I was like, okay, lady, like humble yourself. You're this small on the planet. But what did happen is that last bit of shame that last bit of just kind of not telling people it's not, wasn't a secret, but I wasn't going and sharing it with the world. 
And it's just, it evaporated. And I wrote, rewrote the book and it was a memoir. And I just, all these other people's stories and dreams and things that happened in the past, I forgot about and blocked out. And I just was like, this is me, but it's other people. So when I was writing Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict, I was sitting there going, who is this girl? She's me, but she's other people. And on Pandora, that song Roxanne by the police came on. You don't have to put on the red light that song. And I was like, it's Roxanne. Everybody has some Roxanne on in them. Everybody's been in a bad relationship or done something immorally they wouldn't want to do in a relationship, but they did it anyway. So that's what I wrote the book. It's about Roxanne. It's her first year of sobriety and sex and love addiction while she's in a Hollywood as a working actor. And it takes you behind the scenes. And she comes up with these 10 rules that she lives by to get through her first year of sex and love addicts and it's roller coasters and it's slipping and it's the worst of the worst and just imagine your diary all the th- bad things the horrible things you've done said yeah. thought it's like a long share a yeah. lot of people in my program read it and it's like it's like a long horrible share <laughs> but you know what if if not you who i always ask um, that of myself and and that is sort of like the foundation or the basis of our show is i mean if we're not telling the truth uh, you know our interviewers or interviewees our guests what's the point yeah and and it's like addiction no matter what it is has always been this thing that like you said until you get caught Mm -hmm. that's when you deal with it and everything that person does you can generally say is to avoid the consequences of that yeah and these the people like yourself that write it all out, share it across the world on every platform, give people the chance to question these themselves, to seek help, to do something before the getting caught part comes into play. And that is the, the opportunity that nobody, you know, that nobody seems to get sometimes unless somebody's sharing these stories. So props to you first off. Thank like you. that's, you know, and I, and I was looking at, um, uh the the secret life podcast Mm -hmm. and i mean it's the same the same thing yeah your secret life on a podcast like and the topics are aren't just love and sex addiction it's it's everything from sexual abuse survivors um you know ocd uh body dysmorphia overeating like i mean i i love listening to that It, it just it inspires me you know, that people share their truth because I, when I'm listening to it, I know how important it is beyond my own shame and embarrassment when I get that opportunity to, to, to share that story myself. You yeah. Know? And that's why I did it. I mean, Secret yeah. Life podcast, again, I never wanted to do a podcast. I hate the sound of my voice. I don't even watch <laughs> myself on camera, people. I like do. I'm dead serious. But what happened is I woke up after that Huff Post article and I, three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, Oh my God, secret live podcast. Other people tell me their secrets because I felt such a great relief and that other people reached out to me and said, me too. I've done that. My wife's done that. My husband's done that. My mom did that, all those things. And so I'm like, I started just recording. And the first one I got was this girl in New York that shot herself in the chest with a shotgun. And she for suicide because she was trying to find perfectionism and she couldn't Mm. find it. And she walks me through. And then the next one was being a call girl in Los Angeles in the early nineties and the drug epidemic. And then someone else coming out a gay story and then emotional incest and incest with their mom. And then using abortions as birth control. And it just kept coming and people kept reaching out. You know, a lot of ours are anonymous. I change a lot of people's names, but we have like celebrities, Olivia Munn, Jana Kramer, you know, uh, Jonathan Sheck. All these people have come out and told me their secrets. And my whole point of the show is tell me your secrets and I'll tell you mine. So every show I try to tell a secret because it's two addicts, it's two survivors, it's two people that have been through trauma are relating because our listener doesn't have a voice. It's not about me, it's not about my guests, it's about the listener, and that's what's important. And we've released our 50th episode, and we have 101 episodes still recorded. So we're just gonna keep putting them out there until you guys are done listening to them. (laughs) But 
I'm I mean, really proud of it. It's like you one should of be the proud of it. I mean, conversations. I mean, when you show up to the rooms, you really think that you're the only one and no one gets me and like you don't understand. I'm and yeah, but and, and yeah, but. And then you have this moment where you're like, uh, you know, everybody you, I always have this saying sometimes when I share on, on step one, it's like, you know, I, I always wanted to be someone with someone else somewhere else. And, and then you end up in a room where the person you wanted to be, you know, the guy with the boat and the car and the house is sitting in a chair next to you, <laughs> you know, and you're like, wait a minute, like, a minute. I thought Shouldn't that's supposed fixed? to, you, that should be perfect. And, 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 and we're, we all have, you know, something in common. And um, I wanted to talk to you because we've done some some shows about neuroplasticity and mm-hmm. and all that without getting too you know uh, brainy and, and technical and, and all that a lot of what you said in the very beginning of the show you did this for a year mm-hmm. you know looking down and not doing this and not you know you made these li- these list of of um you know bottom, line. uh, bottom lines kind of like your own constitution darren has mentioned on the show before i make a constitution for myself and and what are my guidelines but over time, the science shows, you know, patterns, mm-hmm. behaviors change and your brain changes and, and you actually create, you know, this uh, this fluid neuroplasticity going on for you. So you actually do become a new person. Have you ever thought about that and, and what you do, what you did for that year is, is one of the reasons why you were able to overcome this? Oh, 100%. A hundred percent. If I did not take that time to heal, to feel my feelings... My, my therapist calls it getting, I, getting through the garbage of our insides, digging through the S, the shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say shit, yeah. but digging through the shit to get to our gold. Talk about all the trauma, all the things I've done, people have done to me. You have to dig through all that pain that we push down, that we use isms on top. If I did not do that withdrawal, if I did not take that two and a half years to do my fourth and fifth step, if I did not write those letters for living amends to the people I have wronged. If I didn't set those really strict bottom lines, I would have never gotten healthy. I would have blown up my life. I would probably be trying to fill myself with some job, some person in a different location. Like I knew that. I knew that moment in a hotel room on location about to cheat once more, about to intrigue and flirt with someone I didn't even like. I had that moment. Am I going to be doing this every day for the rest of my life? Am I going to be 80 on my deathbed, never connected to another soul, always Mm. having one foot in and one foot out. And that to me was more tragic. So I said, I'm surrendering, like walk me through this pain, get me to the other side. Cause you can always go back. The using is the easy part. Like I will surrender. I will do what I have to do to get better. And there was this one moment that I woke up and just it all evaporated, like all that pain. But that's when the real work starts. That's when you got to double down. That's when you got to go to more meetings. I go to more meetings now than I did when I started. I go to nine meetings a week. It is for my soul. I, and, and my bottom lines changed. Now my bottom line is don't cheat on my husband. Don't flirt. I don't want to flirt. If you, fl- nobody flirts with me. I could literally go anywhere and nobody flirts with me because I don't give off that yeah, needy yeah. energy. That is not like, feel me, feel me, want me, tell me I'm pretty, tell me I'm awesome. Like, I don't want it. And it's so beautiful to walk down the street and not have anybody else's needy energy coming at me. And then we have top line behaviors. You turn to your top line behaviors. That's nice things you do for yourself. You take yourself on a date. You date yourself. You buy yourself flowers. You go to the beach. You go to a dinner, just you. You know, you take yourself to the movies. I never went to the movies by myself before. Like I, the first time going to the movies was like a big deal by myself. And I walk through the book. And then we do dating plans, which I didn't do, but I've taken a lot of people through the program. You know, you, you do one date a week. You only have a phone conversation for 30 minutes. You don't text conversations. You don't be flaky on your friends to go on a date. All these things, you set these boundaries to then have a beautiful life with top line behavior. So it's, it's a progressive, you know, after I'm not that cheater anymore and that user and manipulator, I then have to like go to the next layer and be like, okay, 
where does that negative talk run my life? Where are my boundaries around negative talk? Where do I stop that going into fantasy when I don't want to deal with my reality? So it is progressive. You change over time. And, 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 and go ahead, Darren. It all, it all changes. Like, I mean, you know, not to negate, you know, the amazing story, but a- anybody that is sort of like, not just like, yeah, I haven't used in a long time. Like people that like describe transcendence in, in mm-hmm. their life. Like it, it, it's, it's all of that in the beginning, that effort, that willingness, that, that building of resiliency, like the no matter what sort of mentality are, is the catalyst to the, to the success. I mean, I, I've been in, in and out of the, the program so many times. I used to say, like, I just dazzle people with mediocrity, you know, because that's all I needed to do. I can be completely mediocre and not right. you, you know, yeah. and, and, and I get the consequences of, of a mediocre effort. You know, and that's just not being satisfied and not not being content. And, and Darren, you're okay with that because you don't know any different. That's right. You're because you haven't gone to you haven't, you know, realized like there. You know, now you got this beautiful family, and it's like you didn't you didn't know that you know 15 years ago when I first met you. You know, it's just you know how how can I you know be the coolest person in the room? And 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 now, the funny thing is is. Now you are the coolest person in the room, Darren. Props to you because it's like people know you've changed and you've become this wonderful father. And like it's just it's different. And and if you stick around long enough, you actually see that. And and that's a big piece of this is you you become you know a new person. And the people around you, like you say, you can attract shit or you can repel it. And and recovery helps you learn how to repel it. And 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 that's all about step six and step seven. And uh, if you want to know more, uh, do some do some step work and you'll figure it well, out. And I love, I have to say that I love you talking about the mediocrity. You can get sober, and but then you're not spiritually sober. There's something about taking that next step and surrendering and really looking at why you used in the first place and doing that work because that's where the serenity in your mind it's it's all in our mind you know whether if it's a chemical a person a place a thing or whatever but i love that because a lot of people in my program they get sober it's mediocre then they get in a relationship and then they think they're fixed and they leave and then they come back five years later and they're like i blew up my life again Like I did pick that unavailable person because I didn't do the spiritual work. It's about getting down and doing that spiritual work because an addict, their addict is in the corner doing pushups. We've all heard that saying, if a trauma happens, your addict is just waiting to take you over in some little form. And then it just gets bigger and bigger. If you do not have the tools, if you do not go to the program or a program or talk to a therapist or whatever, that's what I truly believe. And just- just on on this note, I, I we've been talking about like raw honesty. That's that's your story. That's your book. That's the podcast and sort of the healing that comes about and the message that that comes across the the airwaves. What is the the disclaimer for someone listening new that's that's vibing through this interview? Like mm-hmm. this is me. This is me. I'm glad I, there's an actual place for people like me that doesn't. Uh, put their foot in their mouth too soon because I think there can be a too soon to all of this rawness and and where we feel ashamed and embarrassed of of saying too much and and not coming back to that community where I've done that like what do you say to that that person that is 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 feeling a vibe of Mm -hmm. of a solution here and like like knowing that it might not be perfectly safe walking into a room full of, of people with these stories and, and sicknesses as well. Yeah. Like you might not be there. You might not be at the meeting that yeah. night. You, yeah. You know, like, yeah. No, I hear you. Yeah. I just have to say to that being in a sex and love addicts anonymous room is the safest place for you to be in this world. Just so you know, that's the safest place I feel in this world. The boundaries in the room, the, you know, that where what we keep in the room is so strong that there isn't any 13 stepping. You cannot get sexually graphic. You cannot wear certain things. You have to be covered up. There is so strong. You cannot talk to the sex you're attracted to. You cannot sponsor. You cannot try to pick up. 
It is literally my favorite place in the world. And I talk about it in the book every year. They have a retreat in Malibu and it's like 80 to 90 sex and love addicts, all races, all ethnicities, all ages go to this retreat, spend the night over a weekend. And people are like, that's insane. A bunch of sex and love addicts sleeping at like a retreat over the weekend. (laughs) And it is the best place in the world. It is so safe. So if this resonates with you, go online, look up sex and love addicts anonymous, do the 40 questions. There are tons of zoom meetings all over the world. Los Angeles is the biggest. There's 15 meetings a day. You know, there's women meetings, there's men meetings. I love the co-ed meetings because it really lets us see the humanity of the opposite sex for me. I get to see a man cry about the trauma he's been through and I then see his humanity. So I don't want to use him. I don't want to use those people. And just speaking, you go into one of these rooms and it's an A-list celebrity, a CEO, a janitor, um, a school teacher. It's like all walks of life and it is just... So get online, get on a Zoom meeting, change your name. Don't say anything. Just listen, listen. You know, that that's brilliant. I mean, I can go to a meeting and see everything that's wrong with it and, and walk yeah. myself out of the room. Oh, totally. And then, and then over time, you, you really realize, you know, just the beauty and the diversity. And and, and that's the unity piece. It's, it's just beautiful to see all, all the different types of people and, and the ones that um, may not be as healthy as you would hope would be in the rooms. You see the beauty in that too, that they can recover. When you see them recover, it just validates everything. And and the other piece is like one thing that we do with our guys here, we have a sister program. And so there's a lot of men and women in the meetings and, and mm-hmm. we have that conversation. It's like, do you want to be the reason she leaves treatment? Yeah. And it just changes the conversation. I never thought of it that way. And actually, they never thought of it that way. You don't. That they could be the reason that this woman leaves treatment and she's got a two-year-old kid who's not going to have their mom because she's back to using. It's the ripple effect. It's, it's crazy effect. what happens. She's I mean, I just she's get the, the tingles one. thinking. She's the one. Yeah. No, you know, let me just tell you, she is not the one. There is no the one. There is no soulmate. You are your own soulmate. If you are looking out there for someone to be the one that is impossible but it's the ripple effect it's the drop the rock pick up that book it's the best book ever you know it's the ripple effect if you hurt her she hurts her child the child will hurt somebody else and so on and so on and when I did my eighth and ninth and tenth step The ripple effect that I saw, I had exes say, the way you treated me, I treated the next girl like a piece of crap, you know? And I saw that ripple effect and I promised I would never, the ripple effect I was giving out the rest of my life was of healing and you are not alone and we are in this together and there is nothing wrong with you. You just, you got a bad deal in the beginning. You didn't get the tools for a healthy relationship, but you have the tools now. So don't hurt the next person in line. And if everybody did that in the world, if everybody did that, can you imagine what the beautiful world it would be? If everybody Mm. didn't bring their baggage from the last relationship to the new relationship, oh, like it could just be such a beautiful world. It would be definitely if everybody did a set of steps, it'd be a beautiful world. Well, we were going to talk about at the beginning of the show, we said we were going to talk about uh, Vancouver's uh, release to Health Canada on their policy for uh, drug thresholds. So we're not going to be able to talk about that today because this has been a great interview. We went into overtime. So catch us next week and uh, we'll talk about uh, the mayor of Vancouver's Vancouver model for decrim and all the protests that are going on around that. Um, At the beginning of the show, we talked about the residential school incident and the 215 children Um, so don't forget you can make a donation in honor of that and uh, at www.irsss that's three s's.ca so that's how we started off the show today it's been an amazing um, interview here uh, we're talking about secret life of a hollywood sex and love addict is the book uh brianne davis you've been like just a great guest thank you so much and thanks thank you and just you know the the energy and so forth like i believe you like this is great thank you that means a lot and if you do have any questions please reach out to me on instagram at the brianne davis i answer all of my instagrams i can send you links You are not alone. There is a way out of your pain and bad relationships. And if there is any drama in your relationships, please just give it a look because it's so much more beautiful on the other side. I love it. I love it. And and the whole idea of of the true validation that we all deserve and really in like deep down 
are searching for and need as human beings is is found when we're when we go through our suffering like you know with with our own stuff with our own dignity with our own, like i love the way props to your husband before we end the show oh yeah, like yeah to props have, to your husband yes <laughs> we've just had that level of understanding to let you go through what he wasn't going to be able to fix for you like i think that it sums up relationships uh, uh the difference between successful and unsuccessful like to a t and 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 in there uh, a beautiful partnership and support can prosper. Yeah, two whole people coming together, not They're trying to fill each other. Exactly. <laughs> You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, 100.5 FM, every Thursday, Talk Recovery Radio, noon to one. Guests from around the world talk about the many pathways to recovery. And today we learned a lot about sex, love, slaw, sex and love addicts anonymous. Um, so go ahead. If you think you got some issues and you're vibing from this interview to go to that website and do the 40 questionnaire, the link to the website is. It's slaw.org 40 questions, but sometimes it's easier just to type it in Google. <laughs> okay. And uh, your Instagram page is at the Brianne Davis and you can go to secretlifenovel.com and read all the articles and all the things you need for the program are there in my book. All right. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Darren. Always good to see you on Thursdays. Have a good weekend, everybody, and catch you next week on Talk Recovery Radio powered by New West Recovery. Take care, everybody.